yeah, let's get the uh, let's get started. Well, you all probably know what Rust for Linux is about. Uh, I have a lot of slides, uh, so I will try to go fast, and uh, I will get a warning after half an hour so that I finish uh, because I have some important things at the end of the talk, and then we maybe can have a bit of a discussion. Um, the Rust for Linux team that is present in LPC should be around. I think I don't see them yet, but uh, they should be around. So we can answer questions as a team as well. Uh, uh, yeah, so let's get started. So to begin with, let me see if the keyboard, yeah. So to begin with, uh, I wanted to come back to the basics a bit. Um, and I wanted to discuss what uh, the goals are of Rust Linux. As you know, we have this sentence. Um, in many places, uh, uh, this very generic sentence, right, about what is Rust for Linux, right? What, what, what are we exactly doing? Because yes, it's adding support for the, for the Rust language to the kernel, but that's, yeah, that's, that's easy. But what does exactly mean? Because why do we keep it so generic? So these are our goals, our original goals. We have not tried to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have always tried to say the same thing all the time about what we are trying to do. Uh, I have spoken with you know people outside the kernel, uh, Rust uh, project people, uh, maintainers in the kernel, etc., developers and companies, and, and I think there is a bit of a confusion outside when the thing that um, three weeks ago happened with Watson. Uh, there was a lot of you know discussion online. I read like 3,000 comments in two days or something like that online, not replying to anything because otherwise. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't reply, but I, I read. I try to read as much as I can, and I see a lot of confusion. So I will explain a bit the, the goal so that we are all try to be in the same page. So our goal has been always been has always been a full integration of Rust as as a second programming language. That means first class support. Eventually, it doesn't mean that maybe now it's possible, but eventually we want to have Rust, uh, uh, you know, first class. Whatever you can do with C in the kernel. The ideal, the, the eventual ideal goal is that you can do it with Rust as well. Of course, that will take time, but that's the, that's the goal. It's not, it's not about out of three. We are focused on in three. The project since it started it was about in three and upstreaming the support. Uh, there were other, other projects, and I have spoken about that in, in the past, about you know, people doing out of three modules, linking uh, the object file with, with, uh, with a C module, et cetera, et cetera. But this is in three, first class support. It's not limited to loadable modules either, so it's also for built-in code, built-in modules, and also for, you know, eventually, you know, uh, uh, could be subsistence as well, core APIs, you know, in years, okay, if everything's successful. But what I'm trying to say is we are looking also to that. I mean, we, we are not saying, oh, it's not for core APIs, if we can, and if, because we believe this is really a, a, a good language for the kernel, so if eventually we can get to that point, that's our goal. I mean, it's not we are not trying to uh, uh, hide that or anything. Of course, it will take a lot of time to get core APIs, some subsystems, etc., written in Rust. But some maintainers are already eager to, hey, can I experiment with this? Can I write my subsystem in Rust, etc., which is which is also great. Um, yeah, it's not limited to kernel space uh, code, and by that I mean you know we have also uh, host programs and, and user programs in in the in the build system of the kernel in KBuild. Those we can also use Rust. Uh, we, in fact, have already one uh, a script that runs in the, in the build uh, process in the kernel. So it's also for other things, not just kernel space code. And yeah, it's also about sharing infrastructure, sharing the, 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 you know, the standard library and putting everything uh, common in a single place. Uh, this was a difference with other projects uh, before Rust for Linux. So yeah, those are the goals. I think, I hope that clarifies and it's very to the point of some confusion that I have seen uh, online. Um, this slide is from RustConf uh, uh, last week, where I spoke about, um, because we get this question as, as well, whether Rust for Linux is a Rust project or a kernel project. Uh, well, it's, we are part of the kernel, it's a kernel project, we are not part of the Rust project. Um, but it's not really only about the kernel either, because Rust for Linux is kind of a meta project, if you will. It involves a lot of projects, you know, tool chains, et cetera, et cetera. So it touches a bit of everything, and we are trying to bridge, bridge uh, the gap, okay? Okay, so I will go fast here because, uh, as I said, I, I have to get into other things. So we have a growing community. This is uh, essentially the same kind of slides from last year, but how we have been growing. We have uh, about you know, uh, 80 more subscribers in the mailing list. We have, in Sulip, we have 200 more uh, compared to last year. If you see the 
Maybe I should use a dot here for remote. Uh, if you see the, the spike here, that was exactly when three weeks ago uh, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one here, which we cannot really see in the next slide, we will see better. The other one here was the, I think was the, the, the merge. So yeah, these two spikes are the, the you know, online discussions uh, going on. Uh, we also got more ac daily uh, active users, uh, slowly increasing over time as well. Messages, messages, uh, they increased uh, quite by a lot. Even if we didn't get too many more daily users, the messages, you know, if you take the derivative, I mean, it, you see that it's like, going faster, right? Uh, um, which is it's nice to see. Um, and those messages are not related to, you know, uh, discussions about what we saw online. So those are re like real development uh, technical uh, discussions. So the core team, uh, I wanted to say we are growing the core team. It's true, we are growing in a sense the core team. Trevor joined this year, and I am also looking for uh, new people to try to grow the team. So what we do in the Rust subsystem is have both kernel people, of course, as usual, that maintain the Rust subsystem, you know, but also to help other subsystems to begin with Rust. And this is something that we, we try to do, and we have some of the people there. In fact, uh, uh, many of them are really Rust experts. Uh, compiler developers in the Rust side, also part of the Rust project, uh, you know, they, they are really experts on the language, and we have leveraged that, that knowledge uh, uh, a lot, and I'm, I have a world class team here that I, I am not uh, in, uh, on par with them at all, so uh, thank you a lot for, to all of them, uh, thank you to the team for, for uh, being there, and yeah, we are trying to grow that, so Trevor is new, of course, uh, Watson uh, recently left, so we are uh, uh, the same number, more or less now, um, yeah, Trevor is, uh, as I did last year for the new reviewers, Trevor is uh, uh, a contributor to, to several upstream uh, Rust uh, teams. He uh, contributes to the compiler, he contributes to, to the library, the standard library, uh, and other things. So yeah, he's quite experienced and he also likes to review uh, networking stuff, NetDev uh, drivers, and he is, was involved with the file library and the two file uh, drivers that we have now upstream. Um, yeah, so that's, that's great. And he maintains uh, that, if I'm correct. He's a maintainer there. So this is the biggest slide. I'm sorry for all the text. There are too many things. I cannot talk about all of the, like the, the, Some people say, oh, it's going slow. Yes, I know people want to see more progress. But upstreaming is sometimes hard. We need users. And uh, you know all these rules. But this uh, is the biggest slide that I cannot really go into it. Please read it offline. Please ping us if you need uh, you know, details about many of these things. Uh, but yeah, as you see, we went through some PRs. Uh, they are getting bigger. Uh, I included here PRs from other subsystems subsistence that I will also uh, talk about a bit later. So there is other people getting involved, other maintainers. This is a question that we got in the Maintainer Summit uh, the other day. Uh, so yes, there is subsystems and maintainers, kernel maintainers getting involved with Rust and helping, and that's great to see. Um, yeah. I also had there, uh, in the bottom, I have also some work in progress, things that are for the next cycle or future cycles. And it's just, uh, I, I try to remember everything, but uh, and, and fetch everything, but I'm, pre I'm pretty sure I forgot things. Um, one major thing I wanted to discuss today, uh, and I think it's important for the kernel, is the collaboration with Upstream Rust. Uh, this means uh, the Upstream Rust project. I think it's very important because, as you know, we are using unstable language features. We are, you know, there is a single compiler right now. They are still developing some parts of the language that are important to the kernel uh, to get right and to, and to do uh, what we need. So I think it's very, very important to, to mention that uh, we are now having a greater or bigger or you know, more frequent collaboration with Rust project. That's great. Uh, I cannot uh, stress enough how great that, sorry, how great that is. We have regular meetings with uh, essentially the language team for the moment, but they also you know, put us in contact with, with others. We have a big week, uh, every two weeks um, we meet with them. Uh, thank you to Josh uh, Triplett, Nicole Masakis, and, and, and Sita Scarry for, for setting that up uh, in RustNL uh, uh, a few months ago, or some, some months ago. Uh, and also, what they did is uh, the kernel, Rust for Linux, the kernel, uh, is a flagship Rust project goal for 2024, uh, the second half of 2024. So this is a new, uh, let's say, uh, thing that they are doing to, you know, uh, uh, they have some project goals that they consider important as a project, high level project, you know, Rust wants to, you know, solve things, for example, for embedded, for, for the kernel, for other use cases. So they have some goals that they are going to uh, work as a, as a, as a project uh, um, 
And, and, and the kernel is one of them. It's one of the flagship ones. So this is essentially showing the commitment from the Rust project to the kernel. And this is something that we, we really uh, needed as well. And they are, the goal of that flagship, the, the goal is literally closing the largest gaps that block building uh, Linux on a stable Rust. So essentially, we got the language team, other teams, you know, uh, key people in the Rust project pushing for getting the kernel to build in a stable Rust. Uh, it includes language library, compiler, CI, et cetera. Uh, please see Nico's keynote in RustConf last week, as well as uh, uh, our keynote. Uh, we have some details there. Also, I want to thank you. You know, this is the people I could remember having chatted, having doing things, but there is more people that I probably forgot. This is people from the Rust project, contributors to the Rust project, uh, team leads, team members. There's a lot of people that has been helping, uh, and I want to really mention all that, all that people because I think it's, it's very important. We, we couldn't have done uh, uh, all that, with, with that without them, and I think it's very good that we have the, the, the contacts uh, uh, directly. We, we, ha we, we can be in contact directly with them. You know, it's different. Like With the C committee, for example, the C++ committee, of course, we have contacts. For example, Paul goes to the C++ committee, blah, blah, those things. We have a more, I, I guess, more direct relationship with Rust right now. The kernel can influence right now the language. So if you are interested in Rust or in languages, uh, language uh, you know, development, you are interested in getting the best language that we can for the kernel, for the future uh, uh, of the kernel. It's the right time to, to, to get involved and, 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 and get there and, and solve problems that, uh, that, uh, that we could get. So there are things that Rust does that C doesn't, and vice versa as well. But it's the right time to say to the Rust people, hey, we need this for the kernel. This would be great because maybe we don't have that in C, and I will show a couple of examples later. Uh, another thing that came out from the collaboration, and this is something that I want to stress because I think it, it, we didn't maybe, uh, we didn't reach uh, too many people, but every Rust PR right now, so every, every contribution, every code change, whatever, however small, that goes into Rust, the compiler, language, library, everything, build test the kernel, the Rust side of the kernel. Okay, so the kernel is now in the Rust CI. That means for unintentional changes, not intentional changes, intentional changes are different, you know, there can be still, it's not 100% guarantee if there is a security bug, if there is something they really need to change, we have to discuss with them on the unstable feature side. But apart from that, everything else that is unintentional, they will fix it before merging that code. So that means, in general, even the nightly version of Rust now builds every day the kernel, it should work. Okay, it's not again 100% guarantee, but yeah, it just works. I took this also to the uh, GCC, uh, uh, at least one GCC maintainer and also the Clang maintainer uh, to say, hey, Rust is doing the kernel in the CI. Can we get it in, in GCC and Clang as well, the kernel? You know, it would be great. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to also uh, use that to improve other things. But yeah, this is great. Like this, I, I cannot stress enough. It's a small thing. It didn't take long, but it was a, it's a huge thing to, to, you know, to ensure that at least things work, even if we are using unstable features for the moment, okay, until those get stabilized. So, let me see the time, yeah. That means getting the CI also meant that it was easy for us, or it was much easier to decide, to unpin the, the, the Rust version. So now we don't have what we had before, which, you know, we only built uh, the kernel, we could only build it with, with a single stable version. I mean, we could do more, but it would take more maintenance effort on our side. So we decided, hey, because they did the CI, we unpinned the version. And now you can build the, the, uh, the kernel with uh, Rust uh, 1.78 until nightly. So, and it will keep increasing, right? And then we are essentially in the same um, state as in the, as in the C side, where, where we just increase the minimum version uh, from time to time. When do we do that? When do we increase the minimum? So we'll have to see. Uh, there are some future good reasons for that. For example, if we get field projections, which is a feature that uh, Beno uh, uh, in the team is working on in the language, of, uh, in the Rust language, if that we get that, it would be, I think, a very big reason to, for example, increase the, eventually the, the minimum version of Rust so that we can get field projections used in the kernel. That's a very nice feature that we want to get from Rust. And it's one example that I mentioned before, that one of the examples I wanted to mention. Uh, Debian, we contacted Debian, so the Rust project and, uh, and, and Rust for Linux, we contacted together Debian to see if we could use, for example, another thing is that the new edition, the new edition is coming uh, soon in Rust uh, uh, 1.85. And if we want to use that in the kernel, we would like to have, we need to increase the, we would like to increase the minimum version and we would like to put it there for Debian stable. So we want that Debian stable support the kernel. Okay, I will talk, um, 
now about more uh, uh, version and distributions. This is one of the changes related. I will not go into details. Uh, um, essentially, we have now the equivalent because we unpin the thing, so now we can do conditional completion. We can do you know, enable things or not, depending on the on the RASI version. So you can use it in kconfig. You can use it in in, in the, uh, for conditional completion in the source code. Um, this also meant the distribution support because we unpin the version. Now we build in all those distributions. So all the distributions, I, I, I have a CI, I test it every day. I mean, I cannot guarantee it works every single time, but essentially those distributions should generally work for building the kernel. And you see, we have even, there are some surprises there because Debian testing and Debian stable, they are now, I don't know if it's an official promise yet, but the maintainer, Fabian, told me, hey, we are, I'm going to try to have the package for Debian for the latest Rust compiler as soon as possible. Okay, so they were, Months ago or one year ago, they were really uh, um, a bit far away from the latest. Now they are very close to the to the latest, or the latest they, they have the, the latest. So that's great to see. Uh, so essentially, in Debian, if you are in testing, it means you get an experience similar to you know a rolling distribution. Um, and another one that I wanted to point out is Ubuntu. Ubuntu, we have an LTS that works as well because they decided to change the policy. I want to thank you. Uh, I was asking for that, and then uh, uh, case. Case I could help me uh, uh, ping uh, uh, Ubuntu and say, hey, we, we, we want this. So they are going to, I know again if it's official, so I don't want to speak for them, but I, they are now backporting, at least for that LTS, they are backporting the newest uh, uh, Rust compiler versions as well. So you don't get the, the Rust C bare package is the normal one that you had before, but then you have versions, uh, version packages with a version number and you can use those and you can install those in the LTS. Uh, what I don't know is exactly if they are going to, because they didn't yet the last time I checked, if they are going to backport to the older LTS, but at least for that LTS, we got it. So that, that's also great to be able to compile the, the kernel with Rust enable there. Uh, we have the instructions for all those distributions. Uh, I have the instructions there. I, I wrote them so you can just copy paste um, and get your 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 your, your dependencies, uh, and you can build the kernel with those. Uh, there are more, uh, so I just have this screenshot. Okay, of course, we still support, this is what we support before, we still support the, you know, the Rust official binaries or the Rust provided binaries, let's say. So the, the, the ones that you get with Rust up, if you have done Rust, you know what I'm talking about. We also support the standalone installers and just uh, to showcase that page because maybe people don't, don't, it's not aware, you don't need Rust up to install it, you have this standalone installer, you can just pick this, download them, you don't need Rust up, you don't need even internet connection, I mean, if you have the, 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 the file. So yeah, and they also added there on you know, the top the archive. We also uh, I asked for that as well because I wanted to have uh, the archive of versions. So if you go there, you can also get all the tables of all the previous versions. We also have uh, from Nathan. Uh, you know Nathan. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have tried. I I, I was chatting yesterday with uh, Knight with with uh, a kernel uh, a well-known kernel maintainer, and they told me, oh, I didn't know about this. So LLVM uh, tool chains that are super fast, super slim. They are compiled with PGO for kernel builds. So that's what Nathan does in that, in, in that URL, well, the parent URL without Rust. So he was doing that for a while. They are super fast. I, I don't know if it is twice as fast, but it's close to that because in the CI, when I try them, it's, it's really fast. So, so if you want a, like, a really fast compiler for the, for the kernel, use that. And the news for Rust is Nathan is also providing a, 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 a packages with Rust as well. So he combines the, 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 the LVM packages that he's giving plus Rust. So you can just pick those and use them as well. Okay, so you have several options to, to, to do. There are more details, you can go into the URL, uh, those URLs and get more information. This is how it looks. Um, yeah, we, we don't have yet uh, 6.11, I guess uh, uh, Nathan will eventually uh, update it. And you have two sets, the one that is with the latest LVM and with the matching LVM. If, for example, you want to do LTO, it's better that you pick, you know, one of the packages that says matching LVM so that you match the, the clang version, the LLVM version of Clan with the Rust, uh, with the LLVM version of, uh, of Rust. So more things. These are slides from GCC Rust. So before I start, and, and I will not read all that, I'm sorry Arthur, uh, Arthur gave me uh, the, the slides. There are two, and this is something that people uh, also uh, may, may not know. There are two ways right now that we can do, compile the kernel with GCC for Rust, okay? Use the, the GCC uh, you know, uh, backend, to compile Rust code. There are two projects. One is the front end that GCC, that the project, GCC the project is developing. That's called GCC Rust or GCC RS. This is the one. This is 
Now in DCC, so if you check out the, the repository, you get the DCC uh, uh, um, uh, code, and you see that the Rust compiler is there. This is very early. It's a completely new implementation of, uh, of a compiler for Rust in our front end. It's very early, but they are committed to, to, doing a, uh, to get to a point that they can compile the kernel, maybe one, two years, whatever it takes. And in fact, they have us in this URL. Uh, recently, they posted this, and it's a kind of a graph of dependencies of what it takes to, to uh, what it would take for GCC to build the kernel. And if you see there, you can s it's not very visible. Let me let me use the dot. So if you see here, Rust for Linux. This is the box essentially of everything that they would they think they would need to finish to compile the kernel to compile Rust for Linux. Okay, so they, we are on the or on, on on the radar, and they Rust for Linux is one of the major or the, the key project that they want to compile. Okay, that GCC wants to compile. And I would like to ask for, there is more things. Okay, I have three slides, so you can, you can uh, see them offline. Um, I would like to ask companies, you know, GCC itself, uh, everybody, please support this project. I mean, I think GCC should really, you know, step up and, and, and support Rust and compile Rust, you know. Uh, it would be nice to have a second implementation of the language. I think it would be beneficial. Kernel maintainers and developers are asking for that. So please, if you can influence or you can, you know, um, Help on that, please ping in me, and, and we can discuss how to how to help. We are trying to you know get funding for them, etc., etc. It's, it's something that we think is important. Now that's the first alternative. There is a second alternative to use CCC for the kernel, and that's the backend in the Rust C <laughs> compiler. Okay, in the Rust compiler. So the Rust compiler you may have heard it uses LVM, and that's true. That's the like the main backend, but they have other backends. They have the LVM backend. They have the GCC backend. This one, they have Crane Lift. They have Others that are not merged yet, like for .NET, uh, I have seen uh, uh, Java, the Java Virtual Machine, uh, the GVM. Uh, and also, I heard also that somebody told me that they are maybe working on, on a C backend, so it would emit C as well. So there are several backends. One of them is the GCC one. We could use that. That one compiles since a year ago the kernel, the vanilla kernel, no patches. So they, just, they can just compile the kernel and boot it. Of course, it's super experimental still, but what I'm trying to say is there is enough things there that, that it just it builds the kernel, okay? So you can have a DCC only build of the kernel, except for Bindgen. And Bindgen is another story. Bindgen is, uh, you know, the tool that takes C headers and, and provides us with the with the, you know, equivalent for Rust. But yeah, for the actual build, uh, this is great. Um, yeah, let me go. Let me see. I'm, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm good in time. Another thing, I'm sorry that I jumped from no, things to things, it's too many things, I, I go fast, I'm sorry. I try to put them in a connected way, but it's, sometimes it's hard. We have now announced uh, recently a Rust docs uh, kernel.org, so that's the render documentation of the Rust code. The usual one that you get, you know, when you use Rust and you see the documentation of a crate, of a library, we get that now in, in, um, in, uh, in, in the kernel for a single configuration. Like we do Intel, and uh, I think I'm doing a dev config with a few things. Uh, so we will have to think about it, we have to expand it, we have to think, hey, we may want to do a one per architecture, we may want to do with, you know, uh, everything that we can enable, we will, you know, that is, we can tweak things, how it works. Um, but yeah, you have the, the tag releases, the main releases, uh, we are still deciding whether to keep, you know, how many to keep in the archive because it takes uh, some space, et cetera, et cetera. You also have Linux Next, so if you want to see what is coming in the new, in the new cycle, you get that, and so on. Um, and it's also built with, I will show in the next slide, sorry. So this is how it looks. You have seen this probably several times. We have, for example, RB3 in the next. This is, uh, if you see in the corner here, let me use the dot. If you see here in the corner, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see the three dots, but yeah. Uh, be below these three dots, uh, there is the next uh, uh, version. So this is an example of that. And we have, for example, right now, RB3 in next, which is coming in the next cycle. And all the you know nice examples. And some people ask me, hey, why do we care? We just read the source code, right? Yes, but in Rust, it's quite useful to read the render documentation. You know, it's, it's not just because of the highlighting and, and that, which is also useful because some people may, may want the highlighting. And, and, but it's also that you can jump between things. You can you know, search. You can <coughs> see what type, what, sorry, what, what types implement, what trait, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's quite useful to, to get that. So please uh, take a look if you are new to Rust. I think it, it, it really helps. And we also have the source view. And we enabled uh, a feature which is new, and, and it will be improved more. But this, if you have used, I'm pretty sure you have used Elixir Boolean or other cross-referencers, you know, LXR. So 
we have enabled a feature that is unstable and they are still improving it, but you will get, you know, you, there are some, you cannot see it well, but if there are some gray, the, um, like more gray or darker background things, and you can click there. So those are links. And uh, the idea is that then you can click and jump around in the source code. So we get something similar to, to uh, a list. Maybe not that good yet, but, but we get uh, something close to that. More things. Coming back to the kernel side, uh, we got the mitigation support for Intel, uh, at least uh, those ones, uh, enough to get an object tool warning uh, uh, free, so uh, a bill of the kernel. So now we have the mitigations, SLS, Red Thunk, Red Pauline. And yeah, we, we fix a few things. We enable object tool for all the code. Uh, previously, we, you would only get it when you were using LTO, so that because it would run in the VM Linux state. Um, but now it's actually running on object, object files as normal, et cetera, et cetera. So we have the mitigations there. We will get more things. There has been also from Google, mainly uh, people from Google working on KCFI, KSAN, SCS, Adocal, uh, Sanitizer. Uh, yeah, those are queued for, for the next uh, cycle. That's, that's also great. They want to use the, all these in, in Android and, and for debugging, et cetera. Um, another thing, um, and this is an example of things that are good to have in, in, in Rust, you know, um, that maybe is different from C, it's an example. So we are going to enforce something that happened in the code reviews is, A, you forgot maybe the safety comment in this unsafe block, or you forgot the preconditions here, or maybe you wrote it where in a safe function, so it doesn't, you don't, you don't, you shouldn't write a safe, safety section with a, you know, UB, UB preconditions uh, there. So we have named some lints that are, in, they were quite recent in, in Rust, uh, and we wanted to do this for a while because it, it will help a lot in reviews because your code will just warn uh, uh, when, when, when you forget to, to do that. Uh, and one of them, in fact, uh, was something that we suggested. One of them was, uh, I suggested the lint and they implemented it. So that's kind of the collaboration I was talking about. This is great. They have done also things in Clippy and other places for us. There is also expect support. Probably you don't know what that is, but it's quite cool. If you don't know how lints work, you know, warnings, diagnostics, lints in, in, in Rust, in C, normally you would disable them per file or per compilation unit, right? You would just say, oh, okay, I don't care about this warning, perhaps global in the kernel or perhaps in a file. But in Rust, you can go more local, and you can disable a lint because you know it's a false positive in a single item, like for example, a function or a statement or things like that. So you can really go local on your, so that you can keep it enabled everywhere else. Now, that's cool because in C, you, you, can, you need the prag mass or you need an attribute that does something equivalent if it is sixth. So that's fine, but expect is one step further and is about if I am allowing, what they call allowing the ignoring a false positive, what expect does is the same, but it will tell you, it will warn if you don't get a warning. So for example, if you have that code and then suddenly it's not that code anymore, the compiler will tell you, hey, I was expecting to have that code here, the lint, but it's not there, so clean this up. So that's a really nice feature. It's hard to use with com conditional compilation sometimes, so we, I wrote some docs to, to explain what I think would be a, a tricky cases, but, but it's, that's a really, really cool feature. And I would like to see that in something like that uh, in C. Another one, very, very quickly, check CFG is one feature that we got involved. It's an, again, another example of simple effective collaboration between the kernel and Rust. We have a lot of uh, CFGs in the kernel. CFGs are the config uh, the, the, you know, the defines uh, that we have in the kernel to, you know, you test with conditional completion, you know, you do an if dev, et cetera. You may have done a typo in the past where you, <laughs> maybe you have an if dev or, or, or you made a typo and, you know, the preprocessor doesn't know if it is supposed to exist or not. So this feature, what you will do, what we will do in the build system is we pass all the expected names that exist under values. And then it will, it will tell you if it sees something that this doesn't recognize, it will warn you. Like, I, I don't recognize this config. So in the kernel, we ideally we will get uh, this working. I tested it, it was fine. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's, great. it's another feature that it, it is, is very nice from Rust and I, I, it would be nice to have also in C or in C compilers. Um, yeah, and, and the Rust uh, people, when we told our feedback, uh, uh, I found a, a, an issue with it because there were uh, 20,000 uh, config symbols in the kernel, and of course, they were printing in the error message, they were printing all of them. <laughs> so, so normally you will have in Rust maybe three, four, five in a normal project, but 20,000, it was like, uh, so they fixed that for us. Uh, we, I hope to, to use it soon. Um, I only had just a prototype back a year ago. Um, Cosinel for Rust, please uh, see Tatagata's uh, and Julia's uh, talk uh, uh, from yesterday in the Rust MC. They have the details there. So Cosinel for Rust is, is going, uh, uh, it's progressing. You have now uh, uh, more improvements. They added the ellipsis construct. 
et cetera, et cetera. So please uh, uh, take a look. Um, these are uh, slides from, from Tatakata. Thank you, Tatakata. Um, Bainjen. Bainjen also is involved with us. Uh, Emilio and Christian, the, the maintainers, are, 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 they have been uh, quite responsive and helping us on, on getting things that we need for the kernel in Bainjen. Uh, I cannot, again, I don't have time to go into that, but uh, thank you. Um, but yeah, for one of them is functional C macros expansion. When you have a macro that resolves into an integer, uh, we wanted that to work even if the macro is not just a literal, uh, if it resolves to something uh, that is a constant. So that uh, is released. We have also raw pointer access for bit fields, so that is sound. We have a new mapping of CNUM, so I, I, we were discussing uh, uh, how to map the CNUMs to Rust CNUMs in a way that is the best, you know, it's, it's sound, and they map, and you get the exhaustiveness checking on the Rust side. And there was no way in binding, there were several ways to generate the Rust CNUMs, but there were no, I would say, optimal way, in my opinion. So I suggested, hey, can we do this new way? We discuss it. Uh, Trevor uh, took the lead there on creating the issue and so on uh, uh, with the suggestion that, uh, that uh, I, 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 I was thinking of, and, and then John implemented it, and, and it's great. I think this should be the default, in fact. If it were up to me, it would be the default in Bindgen uh, for all projects, because it's, uh, uh, I think it's, it's the best that you should do by default. Like, if you don't, if you are generating enums uh, uh, from the C headers, I, I think this should be the, the default, because it's, uh, it's, uh, you cannot make a, a mistake there. Um, sponsors and industry support. I wanted to go quickly through this. Uh, of course, I, I wanted to mention them. We have a lot of companies, you know, entities that have supported us um, or that they want Rust in the kernel. So, yeah, a lot of big names. I just wanted to emphasize that, yeah, even with the recent events, there is still people that, uh, you know, a lot of people that want Rust in the kernel. Uh, who uses Rust for Linux? Uh, users. We have upstream users already, like the five drivers. Uh, which was the first reference, dri reference driver, which I will mention later, and another driver uh, for Phi, the null block driver, the, the, the QR code uh, that you probably have seen. There are other users targeting upstream. The major ones are here. If you go to the Rust for Linux webpage, you ha we have the projects themselves maintaining a subpage in the Rust for Linux uh, uh, website, which tell you more details about what they want to do. And these are the major users. These are the people driving and justifying why we need abstractions in, in, the, in the kernel. And, and those are the, the, yeah, the, 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 the people that really want to, to use Rust. So yeah, thank you to them to, for doing that. Um, topic branches, we have topic branches. It's something that we, I will skip, but it's something that we, we, we have started doing so that it was more obvious for other people outside that, hey, I want to use this code. It's not upstream yet, but it, yeah, we are trying to get it upstream. Rust reference drivers is something that I spoke last year. We were trying to get. Um, and we got it, it's an exception if you're a maintainer and you want to start playing with Rust and you would break the, not the duplicate driver's uh, rule, uh, you know, but you want to start playing with Rust, you cannot duplicate a driver because you break that rule, but you cannot, you don't have any other user. And maybe you just want to have a reference like, hey, I just want the simplest thing that I know about, that I have a C driver that is simple. I, I, I just want the Rust equivalent so that I play with it. You know, it's not a real thing. It's not it's something that would be dropped eventually either the C or the Rust one, but it's something that gets you started with your subsystem and, and creating abstraction. So we got an, like an exception for that rule. Greg still thinks it's, it's bad to do that, but uh, I think it, it, it can help some subsystems, okay? Um, so yeah, if you're a maintainer, please uh, take a look. Uh, there are some reasons there for that. I want to mention also more maintainers and subsystems are getting involved. We got also these questions in the, in the maintainer summit. Uh, who is getting involved? Well, all those, and probably forgot more. Uh, but all those uh, maintainers or people related to those assistants have uh, been really helpful and they want to use Rust and they have been contributing code or, or you know, reviewing the Rust abstractions, helping us uh, uh, reviewing, you know, getting things upstream. Uh, so thank you to, to all of those maintainers. Uh, we doubled from last year the patch submitters. Uh, so they, done, they, they start not to fit in the slides. So there's a lot of people that send patches. Uh, um, and yeah, um, I hope in this case I didn't forget anybody because we have a spreadsheet with, that we use to manage the subsystem and I just copy paste it from there. But yeah, it's a lot of people and it's double from, from last year, the number of people. Uh, later in this track, we will have Danilo, which will give you a, a journey on, 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 on him being a C kernel engineer, starting a Rust driver project. So if you're interested in how it feels if you're a C developer, a C kernel maintainer, C kernel developer, how it feels to start using Rust, please go to his talk uh, later after lunch. Uh, we also had yesterday RustMC, so you can 
please take a look in Rust and C. There are very cool things, uh, you know, talks about more technical talks about abstractions, how things are working, an introduction to Rust, you know, Cosinel, et cetera, Atomics uh, that Botuni is uh, working on, uh, Daniel with another approach for, you know, uh, pure compute libraries, let's say, in Rust, et cetera. So please, please take a look at the Rust and C. And I am finishing. The Maintainer Summit, this is a big one, um, a big topic. My takeaway from the other day is we have to encourage uh, maintainers to play and experiment with Rust. Do not be afraid to merge code, even if it is broken, even if you know make mistakes. There is no user, so don't. On one side, we for Rust we hold a high. We try to raise the bar on you know documentation standard. You know we try to be uh, write the code very nicely and so on and, and and set a good example for the first things going into the kernel. But even if there are logic bugs and so on, it doesn't matter. The other side of things is even if we try to raise the bar on documentation and other things and quality of the code. Please don't be afraid to just upstream. Uh, just even if we make mistakes, it's fine. And I think from the maintainer summit, the, the takeaway is that uh, if you are a maintainer and you are, you know, I cannot upstream this because you know I will have a mistake and you know it's not up to the, you know, I didn't test it so well as the C1. Or don't worry about that. Uh, uh, the high-level maintainers are okay with you upstreaming uh, code, even if it has mistakes, uh, because it will take still, you know, one, two years, three years uh, to get for everybody to get comfortable and, and to see if Rust is worth it and so on. So please play with with, with the Rust support. Uh, iterating in trees, a discussion we had as well, and seeing early approaches. You know, there are sometimes man, uh, developers, very advanced developers like Wesson was that uh, you know submitted patches that were the result of many iterations over many months or years. And what happens is that it's too advanced sometimes or too generalized, too abstract for new people coming to Rust. Uh, so. It's good if we can show maintainers and developers the early iterations and the step-by-step -step process, how you get there. Because to understand the final thing that you want to put in the kernel, it sometimes helps to see the, the iterations. Um, yeah, it's also fine sometimes to break Rust code. If you want, you're a maintainer and you're afraid of, hey, I cannot put it in because I, I will have to review all the Rust colors and so on. It's fine if you decide, hey, let's break the, the, the Rust code when I do a, a, you know, a C update. Okay, we can do that. Some block is doing that. The block, block system is doing that. Uh, I mean, if you can avoid that, it's great because otherwise we don't get Linux next breaking all the time. But what I'm trying to say is, it's an option that you have as a, as a subsystem. Okay, it's, it's okay to break the rule of a hey, let's update all the colors for Rust for the moment. Um, oops, they cannot. Yeah, I want to mention so Cangrejos is the Rust for Linux conference, and I finish. Uh, this was the first year we were in in Spain. The second year, we were also in Spain. And the third year, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, less than a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, in, in Copenhagen. And what I want to show is with this photo is there is, again, not just the companies and so on, but there's also a, a lot of people involved with Rust for Linux that want Rust for Linux to happen. And even if Wesson, which is, for me, was uh, very sad that Wesson left, of course, and he was a, a, you know, a key developer and he, but even if Wesson leaves, even if three more people leave, even if I leave, th this, I think, will, Continue going. It's not. I think the the ball is is, uh, is uh, too big now. Um, so yeah, and uh, even if Watson's departure uh, or retirement uh, look like it could be one of those moments that is the darkest uh, before the dawn moment. So I think uh, we are now in a in a good position. Um, and yeah, uh, so thank you. I, I wanted to leave uh, some minutes for discussion. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? So I, I know the Rust was discussed during the maintainer summit. Could we know what the takeaways were? Yeah, this, uh, this one here. Um, so the, take, the main takeaway is if you're a maintainer. Oh, so this was for, um, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I, I didn't realize summit that this is from the maintainer summit. Two days okay. ago, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the takeaway is uh, if you're a maintainer, please uh, don't worry. Uh, even if you make mistakes, even if, uh, you know, the high level maintainers, Linux, Greg, they, they are okay with that. Uh, you know, they, they, they are not going to uh, hold you to the same, let's say, standard, or I don't know how to put it. Like, you know, you can even break the Rust code. It doesn't matter. As long as you don't have a user, like a critical user or a production user, it's okay. You can even break the Rust code and leave it if you don't have time for a week broken in, in, in mainline, okay? So that that is reasonable. Of course, try to avoid it, but if that's the, the last condition, like, like that's your, your, what holds you, please don't. Okay, so please that's play, the play with it. position for maintainers. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's the, the position from, from the kernel, yes. Right. 
Of course, I mean, again, try not to, like, if you can get involved and you can maintain things, like, for example, DRM, you know, other subsystems, NetDev, they are doing it, like, the normal way. Like, we don't break the RAS code and so on, okay? But if that's, that's the last thing, like, oh, I am, you know, either because you want to update the, the, the colors, you know, and you, you don't have time to maybe review your abstractions in Rust, and, and you know, it's, you, you, have, you are late in the RC process, you, you just need to do other things, uh, you can just drop it. And, but even if you make a mistake and you keep things working, even if there's a logic bug and there is data corruption even in a file system, you want to play with file systems and there is a data corruption issue, yes, it's very bad, but please just play with it because what we are trying to do is let's see if Rust is useful for the kernel, let's see if it is worth it for maintainers and let's see if we can get maintainers to learn a bit of Rust so that they can use it and so on. So what I'm trying to say, even something as bad as a file corruption issue, if you are just playing with it and you are not telling users, hey, use this file system, it's still fine, okay, in the beginning. Of course, in uh, one, two years, we will see how the rules go. But yeah, the, 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 the key takeaway is that uh, maintainers should be less afraid of taking code and playing with Rust, OK? Other questions? Yep. Um, I have a quick question about, so how would you define the success of this project that is would you say, say some number of the maintainers who are committed to or number of drivers that using Rust code were? I mean, to me, oh, this was, went so fast that uh, a few years ago I was, I would never be thinking that I would be here. I, I could never imagine being seen. So for me, it's already a success in the sense that I think the ball is big enough that people, there are maintainers that come to us or they have ideas now, even if they are not playing directly with Rust, but they say, no, no, I, I want to use it. I want to learn it because I know I can do better designs. I can do better. So there are many maintainers that already, they want to use it. Maybe they don't have time now, but they, they want to use it. I think it's already a success. But of course, if we are talking about the, like what is the best success or the ideal scenario? As I said in the beginning, in, in the, beginning the ideal scenario is for me, if we think that the, the Rust is a good language for the kernel, then the ideal scenario is eventually we use it for core subsystems. We can just use Rust everywhere because then we have a way better advantage of Rust. Right now, one of the pain points of Rust is the interrupt with C. You have to, you know, interrupt with C, you have that unsafe layer. If you can write your core stuff in Rust directly, then you don't have that layer in your, in, in, in. so that's a, a key thing and, and it would help, it would, it would help so many things. But to get there, it's a long process still, and, and it will take years if we get there. But I, I think that would be the ideal scenario. It doesn't mean replacing all C, don't get me wrong. It's not, it doesn't mean we, we, nobody is going to rewrite all the C code unless that tractor thing that from, from the government, the US government uh, uh, DARPA uh, uh, works. But apart from that, I don't think we're going to get a rewrite. But the ideal scenario is yes, we write a, a core APIs, we try to write as much new code as possible, especially drivers, you know, the things that are the bulk of the kernel. If we can get the bulk of the things written in Rust, then slowly we can, we can get into a more, uh, uh, you know, we get a, at least less vulnerabilities for Greg to feel uh, uh, in the CV uh, uh, thing, in the, C, uh, the authority, the CV authority, okay? A uh, hypothetical situation, I'm a maintainer, I don't really know Rust very well. I get a big submission with lots of Rust code that I simply don't understand. Uh, I cannot possibly review it and decide whether it's worth merging or not. What do I do? So you have several options. If you are okay with, uh, uh, you know, if you are okay with taking that or having a co-maintainer, for example, you have several options. There are maintainers that have been saying, "Oh, I want a co-maintainer." You take care of the Rust side. You know, that's it. And maybe we, you, you can say, you know, I cannot wait for your updates. So I will break your Rust uh, stuff, and you just update it in a few days. That's good. That's what Block is now doing. Uh, other subsystems are, you know, when they see all those patches, of course, they are like, you know, I cannot review it, so I cannot take it because as a maintainer, you know, I am responsible for it. I cannot just take code that I don't understand. And that's completely understandable. And it's, it's something that I think most maintainers will, will feel at some point or another. But the, the key thing from the Maintainer Summit is don't be afraid of taking it. Like, if you're interested in Rust or learning, don't be afraid of taking it, even if there are mistakes in that code. The point that uh, Linus was trying to say is, you know, you, you, we can fix it eventually. We will get there. It's like in the early days of C, in the kernel. You know, in, the, in the early days of the kernel, we will get there. Like, you don't need to get it perfect. You don't need to hold yourself responsible for getting all the Rust code right, you know, if you are still uh, starting with Rust. So if you want to get personally, like you want to maintain it personally, and you don't want a co-maintainer, you can do that as well. You can say, hey, look, uh, uh, I, will, I will go slowly, and I will try to play with it. I will get patches. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. So there are different ways. You, you can approach it different ways. I have this line. Different subsystems may want to approach things differently. Some maintainers in the kernel already know Rust, and they want to use it like for real, right? Other maintainers are uh, waiting, wait and see, right? What, what, I, what do I do? How much I can commit? And you can commit code into the kernel. And if you decide later that it's not worth it, you know, it's too painful, whatever, we, you know, it can be taken away as well. As long as you don't have a user, you know, using the, the actual code uh, uh, in production, you, for example, you put, can put it maybe in a staging, you can put it in experimental, you know, you can put it behind an expert, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different ways that you can approach. It depends on the subsystem. It depends on the maintainers, how much bandwidth you have, how comfortable you, where you, where you are with Rust, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, um, so uh, I'm guessing there are two separate subsets, at least right now, uh, maintainers who understand their uh, subsystem, and there's Rust people who understand Rust. And in C, there are good ways of writing C, and there are bad ways of writing C. Is there some equivalent of that in Rust? Um, and to tie it to the previous question, uh, are there Rust people who do not know about the subsystem but can help with reviewing just the Rust part, not the subsystem part, and the maintainer as the... So we have, yeah, yeah we, we, for the second question, the first one, I, I'm not sure I, I quite got it, sorry, but the, for the second one, there is for sure the Rust subsystem. What we are trying to do is get Rust experts that really can help you. And in fact, we have examples from the mailing list from somebody, for example, Benno, has been re reviewing a lot of code. He doesn't know any kernel, well, he knows, but what I mean is that compared to a maintainer, he, he maybe is new to the kernel, but still, just seeing the interaction between the, the, the maintainer of the kernel and Benno, the Rust expert, interacting in main list and deciding, oh, we can do this, oh, no, these are the requirements from the, from the subsystem, you know, it helps on documentation because they, essentially, they are documenting the thing in the main list over, you know, when they ping pong the question and so on, and they get to a point where the, 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 the kernel maintainer can ask, hey, can I do this with Rust? And then they, the other guy says, oh, yes, you can, you could do it like this, and then the kernel maintainer says, oh, that's nice, maybe you can do, so you, actually, it's a very nice experience because it, yeah. because the two sides don't know each other, you get to a very nice design because you right. talk to each other, right? Right. Yeah. Sounds nice. Okay. So, is the expectation also that all Rust patches are uh, CC to the Rust list? Just so in the beginning we said, yeah, please, please. It's not a rule, but just mm. please CC us so that we can help or we can know at least that, for example, I can now come and say all the things that are going. Yeah. In the, eventually, no. Eventually, I mean, so if you can and you remember, please CC us so that you, we can, we are aware of what is going in. But eventually, no. It's going to be like any other. Uh, okay. you know, yeah. Uh, sure. Makes sense. Thanks. On the topic of having you know Rust people review stuff, so things that have happened in on, on real patches is, so on one example we have patches that um, you know they have gotten some reviews from the C maintainers who have said stuff and we have had discussions with them, but then if you look at for example the pi file patchlet, it also has four reviewed bias from Rust experts, right? And so you know the Rust experts will review the Rust code to say is this idiomatic Rust? Is this how you write Rust? And the C side will say, oh, this thing, um, you have to make sure the ref counting here is actually done completely right. And this combination, I think, is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Another thing we have done, both for the work queue and just very recently with the HR timer, is to sit down with some Rust people and the maintainers, either in person or over a video call, and go through the patch together. This has happened, and you can ask for this, and we will do it. And we are yeah. very happy to do that kind of stuff as well. We, of course, we cannot scale it. Uh, if, if everybody starts using Rust, we cannot scale it. But if you are one of the early ones, you can take advantage of that, right? <laughs> so it's a good time to learn Rust. You have the experts available. So if you want to learn Rust, it's a good time to do it. And another thing that uh, I wanted to mention is um, uh, the, you know, another thing that uh, uh, I forgot. It was something that Alice said, and I want to do. Um, Ah, yes, the, document yes the, the C documentation part. It also helps, and not just with the C documentation, but also with bugs. Wilson was working on you know, several subsystems in the early days, and he found vulnerabilities in the C side. He found issues. Other Rust people have found. So just the interaction and the, this, the, this design process in the mailing list and so on also finds improvements for the C side. And for example, also Greg has been helping on, for example, something easy like putting const correct signatures in C, it will help the Rust side as well. And you know, we have found improvements on the C side as well, and, and it's also something that can help uh, the C side. Even if you, in the end, we drop everything Rust, it would have help, I think, uh, uh, the C side. We're running a little bit over, so I think we're gonna have to stop. Uh, I would recommend folks come back at 3.45 for Danilo's talk about 
a C kernel engineer uh, journey for Rust. Uh, and let's thank Miguel for a really great presentation. Thank you, Dave.